Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Di and today I'm bringing you my November wrap up. In November I read 15 things. Four of them were novels, one of them was a novella, and the rest of it was manga. The manga that I read was only from two series, so I will be including my thoughts on those two series at the end of this video instead of dedicating a whole second wrap-up video to just those two series. I don't feel like I read too much in November, but I was really surprised when I realized my total count of read books for the month. I did watch quite a bit of television. <laughs> uh, my daughter and I uh, re-watched Haikyuu in preparations for the third season. I also crocheted a bit but I was also on vacation towards the end of the month so maybe that helped my read count a bit. I had family visit for the holidays as well so all in all my November was pretty great. That being said, let me jump into the books that I read for the month. The first book that I finished was The Haunting Season. This is by Michelle Muto. I really wanted a Halloween-y type read as I didn't really get too much into that in October and so I also have been <laughs> neglecting my Kindle Unlimited subscription and Read Your E-Reader Readathon was also going on so I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to just browse around Kindle Unlimited and see what was available I stumbled across this book because it also had a free narration of it along with the ebook borrow. So I went ahead and downloaded, and I am so glad that I did. I really, really enjoyed this book. In this one, think The Haunting the Movie with uh, Liam Neeson and Catherine Zeta Jones, or Stephen King's. Rose Red miniseries, but with teenagers. So we have four teenagers, two girls, two boys. They all have some kind of ability. One of them can see ghosts. One of them has been possessed by demons in the past. One of them can bring back things from the dead, and one of them can send things into another dimension or void. He's not quite sure where the things he sends goes, but they do definitely disappear from here. So these four teens participate in a research like project where they are staying at this house called Siler House, which is supposedly haunted. Two of the teens have kind of had difficulty with their ability. By difficulty, I mean that the ability hasn't really worked for them in the last few months or so. Um, the girl who can see ghosts hasn't been able to see ghosts since her father died, and the boy who can bring back things from the dead has not been able to do so. And so they're kind of they're thinking that this project is going to help them uh, rekindle their ability. And so the story kind of follows these four teens participating in the project, seeing if the house is actually haunted, and finding out about the people who used to live there and the history of the house. I listened to most of this on audiobook because the narrator of this is Tavia Gilbert, and she is one of my favorite narrators. I really enjoy listening to her perform uh, narrations. I think she's really, really good at what she does. Um, and so that, I think, made this a little bit more enjoyable for me. I did read some of it and the ebook copy, of course, but most of it was listened to on audiobook. 
I don't think that I do have a really high tolerance for creepy stories, but I was sufficiently creeped out at certain parts of this book, especially towards the end when we're gearing up for the climax and finale. It was really, really creepy. I jumped a couple of times listening to what was going on and I just really enjoyed this experience. So I ended up giving this one five stars. As I said, I really, really enjoyed this book and I think it was probably my most favorite read for the month. I don't think I mentioned earlier, but Read Your E-Reader Readathon was hosted by Raul over at Latin Lector, who you know I buddy read a lot of stuff with, and Janie over at Bookworms Buddy, so I'll link them both down below. This book satisfied the category for Haunted House, and yeah, I really, really enjoyed it and highly recommend you check it out if it sounds interesting to you. The next book I read was for my first in a series, Cozy Mystery Book Club, and that was Catering to Nobody. This is by Diane Mott Davidson, and it is the first book in the Goldie Bear Culinary Mystery series. I have had this book for quite a while, so I was really excited when I pulled it out of the jar as one of our selections for October. This series follows Goldie, who is a single mother and also has her own catering business. Goldie has a young son and one of his teachers, who he was really close to, just committed suicide. Goldie is catering the gathering at the teacher's house after her funeral. And all of a sudden, her ex-father-in-law gets poisoned. It is found out after some investigation that his coffee was poisoned and so the police decide to have Goldie shut down her catering business until they can figure out if she was the one who poisoned him or not. Goldie does not have a very good relationship with her ex-husband and that just makes things all the worse. The catering business is also Goldie's main source of revenue and so by having to close down her catering business it's really impacting her finances and so she really, really needs to find out who exactly poisoned her ex-father-in-law and get her business back up and running. I started listening to this one on audiobook from One Click Digital, which is offered through my library. It was narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt, and I've listened to a couple things from her before. One of them, I didn't enjoy her presentation, and the other one didn't bother me so much. This one really bothered me. The way that she performed Goldie. Whenever Goldie got mad, it just sounded like she was whining. And that grated on my nerves. I do not like whiny characters. So I had to drop the audiobook and switch to solely reading in physical copy. After I did that, it did help a lot, but I still took a very long time to get through this. I think because I had that notion of what Goldie sounded like, that every time I would read something, I couldn't unhear the performance. So that was kind of a hindrance for me. The story was okay. Um, she has, like I said, she has a really bad relationship with her ex-husband. To top all that off, he was abusive physically and mentally and still doesn't treat her very well and she didn't really ever do anything about it and the story just glosses over it. Um, we meet another character in here who is Goldie's friend but is also an ex-wife of Goldie's ex-husband and he acted the same way with her and again nothing was done it was just glossed over and that 
bothered me. Some of the situations that Goldie has uh, raising her son also bothered me. He, I think, is 12 in this book. And he just, like, orders her around. He tells her, you know, don't sneak up on me. And you can't just barge into my room. And stuff like that. And I... She just lets it go, and I don't agree with that at all. So that is another thing that really bothered me. But as far as the mystery goes, I had no idea who actually was the person who did the poisoning or what the motives were at all. And so that was interesting. This one also came with three recipes, I think. And so I jotted all of those down. I ended up giving this one three stars. I will be continuing to the next one because I do own several of the books in this series. Even though this one wasn't spectacular for me, I'm hoping that the next book in this series will be better because I think some of the things that irritated me should not be included as part of the story in the next one now that we've gotten it out of the way in this first volume. So that's what I'm hoping. Like I said, three stars. This one was okay and I will be continuing on at least to the next one in this series before deciding whether or not I'm going to actually continue with the series or drop it completely. The next book I read was A Deadly Grind. This is the first book in the Vintage Kitchen Mystery series by Victoria Hamilton. This was also a pick for my book club, the first in a series Cozy Mystery Book Club or hashtag book one Cozy's Club. This was a November pick for From the Jar. In this one, our main character, Jamie, and her sister go to this estate sale and Jamie gets more than she bargains for when she bids on and wins a vintage Hoosier, which is like a kitchen appliance, I guess. It's like, it's a cabinet and it has stuff in it. I'm not too clear on what the uses of it actually is, but... It's a type of cabinet and it had some vintage um, kitchen items in it as well. After bringing the Hoosier cabinet home, sometime in the middle of the night, her house gets broken into and when Jamie goes downstairs to confront the burglar, she stumbles upon a dead body. It looks like the person was bludgeoned over the head with the vintage grinder that came with her Hoosier. It does look like this person was after something in the Hoosier cabinet, so Jamie starts to inquire as to what might be in the Hoosier cabinet that is that valuable that somebody might want to burglarize her house for it. This one was a slower paced mystery, at least for me. Um, I also listened to part of this on audiobook. Uh, through Hoopla from my library. Towards the end of the book when things are starting to uncover and you're finding out what the motives were for the murder and who the culprit was, <laughs> I remember looking at the audiobook thinking, oh we're almost done and there was over an hour left. So the wrap-up of the mystery portion was also very long and drawn out. This wasn't as suspenseful a mystery either, though there were suspicious things going on. I kind of already had suspicions about certain people who may have done it. Turns out I was right on some point. Um, there was a few attempts to deflect suspicion onto another character that I just thought was 
I'm looking for another word other than ridiculous because the choice of character just didn't make any sense to me as to why you would try to deflect suspicion to that character but yeah I didn't understand the motives as to why the author decided to try to make that character suspicious because I didn't find that person suspicious at all you know I have been complaining about love triangles in my cozy mysteries lately and I thought that this one was going to be free and clear of it which it was though I do see the possibility of one coming up sometime later in the series so for this book not to have that I did appreciate that very much this one came with one recipe but two versions of it so there is a vintage version and there is one for modern day kitchens so I thought that was interesting to see the difference the vintage version of the recipe is like less than half a page long with its instructions and the modern day version is two pages long so that was kind of funny but I did enjoy this one more than catering to nobody and I ended up giving it three and a half stars and I will be continuing on to the next one in this series. The next book I read was The Titanic Murders. This is the first book in the Disaster series by Max Allen Collins. I picked up this one for Read Your E-Reader as well but I didn't finish it in time for the readathon. This one was for the pumpkin category, which was to read a book with an orange cover. I really enjoy things Titanic. I love watching the documentaries. I own the movie. I've read a couple books, fictional books on it, and I, I just am fascinated. I'm fascinated by the Titanic. And so, when I saw this book on Kindle Unlimited, I thought, you know, it's been a while since I've delved into anything Titanic. This should be a really interesting read. And again, use my Kindle Unlimited subscription. And this one also had a free audiobook with the borrow of the e-copy. This one follows author Jacques Futrell, and he and his wife have been gifted tickets onto the Titanic's maiden voyage. They're not sure what they did to deserve this generous gift from Ismay, but they accept quite happily. The only thing is that it's very near to Jacques's birthday and he is missing his children and Unfortunately, they could not accompany him on this trip, but that is a separate part of this story. They refer to him as Jack um, in the story instead of Jacques, so I'm going to go ahead and do the same. Jack and his wife end up staying in a really great cabin in the first class passenger deck. Jack still has no idea until after the ship departs as to why Ismay gifted him these tickets. Ismay calls Jack to his room and tells him that he would like Jack to consider writing a novel, a mystery novel, which is what Jack is good at, about a murder on the Titanic. And Jack is not too sure that he wants to do that. Even though he's very grateful for these tickets, he is uncomfortable, kind of feeling like he was bribed to write a novel. And so, as Jack is thinking this over, a murder actually happens on the Titanic. Jack ends up being recruited by Captain Smith and Ismay to kind of go around and investigate who might be the one who murdered this passenger. 
Jack does have a history with police work, so that just made him the perfect person to be going around and figuring out on the down low who the culprit might be and the reasonings for it. A good portion of this book dealt more with what it was like to be a passenger on the Titanic and the types of things you could do. Just like uh, the movie, you know how in the movie you get to see all of the rooms and just being on the ship and the descriptions of the decks and all of the things like that. So the story or the mystery part of it didn't really happen until about 40% in. Now I didn't mind that too much because like I said, I was fascinated by all of the descriptions. Um, but it, it was just like, you know, what it was like being a passenger on this grand ship. And the mystery aspect of it was interesting. Um, all of the characters that I am familiar with were a part of this story. And so seeing how these characters fit in with the story that was being told about this murder mystery was really interesting to me. Obviously we know what the fate of the Titanic was and a little bit of that is also um, covered in the author's notes and the epilogue which were two of the most interesting sections of this book for me. I ended up giving this one four stars, really enjoyed it. It kind of rekindled my fascination with the Titanic. I ended up going to watch the movie again and I have the uh, 25th anniversary edition on Blu-ray which had like six hours of behind the scenes and documentaries and stuff. I spent a good ha first half of my vacation watching all of those documentaries and the movie and then I watched a couple documentaries on Hulu and the miniseries that came out a few years ago and I was just immersed in Titanic and this book is the one that moved me in that, that direction so if you like Titanic or things about Titanic I would definitely recommend this book. It was the perfect mix of what it was like to be a passenger on the ship as well as a mystery. And this is the first book in the Disaster series. So this author has I think five other books out in the series about other disasters in history. And I presume that they're going to be following different characters because obviously the disasters are different points in time as far as history goes. And so, yeah, I'm really interested to see what's been on these other disasters the author is going to take. Now on to the novella I read, which was The Great Turkey Caper. This is the first book in the Agnes Barton Holiday Novella Mystery Series by Madison Johns. This one, I thought you could start it as a standalone series. Um, I did want to read something a little bit more festive and this was one that I found that was holiday themed and a first book in a series so I thought that would be a perfect opportunity to get my festive read in and also not have to worry about reading a book that was in the middle of a series. Unfortunately, I think that this novella series should probably not be read until you read either the Cozy Mystery series that precedes it, which has Agnes Barton as the character, or there's also a paranormal series that Agnes Barton is the main character in. So jumping into this novella series was 
a little bit confusing. This one follows Agnes Barton and her friend Eleanor, and they are senior sleuths, so they're they're a little bit elderly. Um, this time in Taos, which is where they live, and I hope I said that right. Um, it's hunting season and there is a prize out if you kill the infamous Tom Turkey. And this turkey is elusive. Like, nobody can kill it. It's probably the oldest turkey in the area. And it's huge. So as Agnes and Eleanor are gearing up for their Thanksgiving festivities, they get a call from their other friend Bernice and Bernice needs their help. She wants them to come over to her house as soon as possible. So Agnes and Eleanor get in their car and drive over to Bernice's only to find Bernice dragging a dead body off her property. So the mystery goes, who is the murdered person and why was he murdered? He was shot with an arrow so Maybe somebody was trying to get that elusive Tom Turkey and ended up shooting him instead. Who knows, but Agnes and Eleanor are on the case and they're going to figure this out. Now most of series books, if it's not the first book in the series, will recap a little bit with the character's background or, you know, maybe reintroduce the characters because usually with books and series, it's been a year since the previous novel. And so there's usually some kind of introduction to refresh the reader as to what these characters had done before, or maybe what their favorite things are, or something. Some kind of background story. This had none of that. So I kind of jumped into this one blind. I had to figure out what uh, their relationships were with other people, um, who some of the characters were in relationship to them, and so that was kind of a bit of a jarring experience. The Their lines of questioning didn't seem like they'd be from mature women. The thought into the questioning and the way, the style of questioning was very much what I'd expect from a teen sleuth and not from an adult. So that bothered me a little bit. It's like they were just jumping, question jumping, jumping, jumping and I don't know. It didn't it didn't make much logical sense to me. Some of the things that they asked were just like, "What? Why are you asking that?" Um the other thing that I thought was confusing was why everybody was so willing to answer their questions. Like they aren't police. They have a reputation of helping the police solve prior cases, but they're not police. Uh, but people were just willing to say, hey, I'll give you the information you need, no problem. They wouldn't even question, who are you to be asking me these questions? Why should I tell you what you're looking for? I don't know, it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, the mystery part of it made sense. I had no idea who the culprit was until it was revealed and the reasonings for it made sense to me. So that was a plus for this book. But other than that, this was a fun read for the holiday. I did end up purchasing a copy of this along with the next one in the holiday novella series which is Christmas themed uh, because they were taken off of Kindle Unlimited right before I decided to read it. Um, 
So I will be continuing on to the next one since I did purchase it. Um, but I think I'm going to try out the author's paranormal series with this character. I think that might be more down my alley because I do really enjoy uh, paranormal mysteries. And it turns out I have it in my library downloaded um, free from Kindle years ago. So I will be continuing, but this one was just okay. Two stars. So now on to the manga that I read in November. I read volumes 5 through 12 of Bride of the Water God. This one is by Yoon Mi Kyung. You know that I have been reading this series towards the end of this year. It is a manhwa about a girl named Soa who was sacrificed to the water god by her village. The village has been suffering a very terrible drought and they think if they sacrifice a maiden to the water god that the water god will bless them with rain. So Soa gets sacrificed to the water god and instead of being killed, she's welcomed into the water god's realm. And so the series follows her relationship with the water god as well as some mysteries as to relationships with other characters that live in the realm of the water god and a past love of the water god. I am really enjoying this series. I'm so sad that I had to return the volumes to the library today uh, because I would really want to show you what the inside looks like. Each volume has four color pages in the beginning and it's just gorgeous. I really, really enjoy this series. Where I'm at right now in the series explores the water god's past and so we get a lot of backstory as to the water god's previous love and his family and I thought that was really interesting. The only thing about this where I'm at right now is that several of the characters have more than one name and I'm getting a little bit confused. But it's not enough where I have to go back and be like, okay, who is this now? Um, and the names are long names, like four names in a row for one person. But you also know this person as this. So some people will refer to that character as the long name and some of them will refer to the character as the short name. So that's the only thing that's confusing me at this point but like I said I'm really enjoying this one. The artwork is just beautiful and I'm really looking forward to continuing on with this one. I ended up giving each of these volumes four stars, but I'm really, really leaning towards that five star rating. And the last uh, series of manga that I read was volumes 11 and 12 of the series Noragami by Adachi Toka. This one is following Yato, who is a very minor, very minor god who does little jobs here and there for people, whether it be wash their toilet or clean their bathroom or find their missing dog. Just little, little things um, for donations. He's collecting these donations so that he can build himself a shrine because if he has a shrine, then he'll have people who will worship him and that is the main goal for him. So similar to where I'm at with Bride of the Water God in Noragami, these two volumes explore more of Yato's past and his relationship with his family, which I am finding really interesting. The relationships between Yato and other characters are getting uh, stronger and he's changing. He's changing quite a bit. And so I am really enjoying this one. I ended up giving each of these volumes four stars as well. 
I have volumes 13 through 16 in this stack right here, so I'm hoping to get to that one sometime next month. And that completes everything that I read in the month of November. So let me know if you've read any of these or if you're interested in reading any of the books that I talked about. I hope you are all doing great and had an amazing holiday if you celebrated. Until next time, take care and smile always. Bye.